That's right, Chamberlain. It is an ongoing matter, the matter of electricity supply and pricing. And you know, now the Minister of Power, Mr. Adilabu, is under some sort of fire, you know, for his comments uh, on Nigerians and how they are managing or not electricity supply. And a lot of people are asking for his head. Well, he's also said something that perhaps, I, I'm just seeing this report and I thought to share it, that electricity transformers and substations meant for the $2.3 billion Siemens Power Project, yes, that Siemens Power Project that we've been talking about has arrived in the country, according to the mis minister, and he said uh, that, on, he said this on a, from, in a statement yesterday, and I believe, and well, tries to tell us that perhaps better days are ahead uh, because we're not just going to pay more for electricity, we could also have more supply and then uh, we'll be able to manage the supply and the usage even better. But let's uh, start off as we normally do on business morning. Uh, this morning from the global space, oil prices, we see slid more than a dollar on a Monday with Brent falling below $90 as Middle East tensions eased after Israel withdrew more so Soldiers from southern Gaza and committed to fresh talks on a potential ceasefire in the six month conflict. And now we look at the numbers right there. A lot of things tightening uh, uh, right there. We see a drop of more than 1%. It's not a normal thing you would see. So you want to know the factors driving it. 1.6% down, that's for Brent, to $89.60. Nine cents, and this I know is still quite high, especially for a country like Nigeria. We have our own target about seventy-seven dollars. So these should be good times for the country. We should be making extra revenue at this time. WTI for the United States is also down one point six percent at eighty-five dollars fifty-five fifty-four cents a barrel. Now let's look at the factors. Obviously, Israel and Hamas is uh, top on that. They sent teams to Egypt for fresh talks on a potential sea fire ahead of the Eid holidays begins tomorrow in Nigeria and that eased tension in the Middle East and drove up oil prices by more than 4% last week. Last week was a very um, well green market for investors in the oil space but of course if you're buying it it's more expensive. Now Israeli Defense Minister uh, Mr. Gallant has said that Israel is ready to handle any scenario that may arise with Iran after Tehran threatened to retaliate for the killing of Iranian uh, generals on April April the first. Now, the world's top oil exporter, Saudi Arabia, has raised its official selling prices for all crude grades to Asia in May, in line with expectations after heavy oil supply tightened. Another factor is that fire struck an offshore platform operated by Mexico's national oil company, Pemex, on Saturday, killing at least one contractor. And this comes after Pemex requested its trading unit to cancel up to 436,000 barrels a day of crude export in this month, April. So we see a lot of things squeezing the price or the supply of oil right there. However, Goldman Sachs expects Brent to stay below 100 a barrel in its base case scenario that assumes already solid demand, no further geopolitical hits to oil supply, and that elevated spare capacity will lead OPEC Plus to raise production in the third quarter. Over in the United States now, oil rigs rose by two to five last week while gas rigs fell by the same two to 110 that's the lowest since January 2022 so uh, we see a whole lot of things going on around oil now the holiday obviously is one let's come back home now and do a continuous um, a follow up on the Naira last week we saw a lot of appreciation all trading days of the week for Friday we saw that in Nafem it closed at 1,251 Naira 5 Kobo after it's gained 0.32% that's at Nafem. At Nafex, it closed at 1,255 Naira 47 after it gained more than almost 2% right there. And we know that analysts, we spoke to Mr. Bismarck Rouhani, and he did say that we should expect that the Naira will, would uh, settle around 1,250, you know, for some time. Uh, but the fair value, according to data available to financial derivatives company, is about 980. But I'm saying we're praying for 700. I'll keep rooting for 700. And one of these days, 
and I just see that right here on the board. Join me <laughs> in this. Now to the matter at hand, which of course is that electricity hike in the country, the Federal Competition and Consumer Protection Commission, FCCPC, has asked the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission to mandate distribution companies, that's the discourse, to meet our all unmetered band A. That was the conversation we had in uh, Sunrise Daily just before we came here. The commission made this known in a statement signed by its acting vice chairman and chief executive officer, Mr. Adamu Abdullahi. Mr. Abdullahi explains that unless uh, consumers in the band A and band B, C, whether they're in band A, B, C, or D, or E, there's no F, is meter, then the discourse should not be allowed to migrate such a consumer to a higher tariff ban to avoid any further exploitation. And of course, the right of the consumers comes in here. How do we get paid back? If I don't get paid back at a certain time, what can I do? Who do I reach out to? How effective is the system? But these are conversations that you'll be getting, you know, of course, here on channels, television, or various programs subsequently. Now we go back to the issue of food security, which is at the top, you know, of every conversation we would have. A hungry man is always an angry man, and even electricity uh, would not even do anything. Uh, this is because uh, the World Food Program has says that there's been an increase in the number of uh, food insecure individuals from eight to 18.6 million naira. Beg your pardon, I've gotten you see money so much. About 18.6 million people are food insecure. We're food insecure at the end of 2023. Conflicts in the Northeast region displaced 2.2 million people, left another 4.4 food uh, people food insecure. Boronu, Adamawa, Yobe. And of course, with a hike in inflation we've seen this year, uh, more people have joined this. Now, uh, we, we know that it's not, it's not really new, but how popular is this? Hydroponics uh, is a technique of growing plants using water-based nutrient solution rather than soil and then include an aggregate substrate or growing uh, media such as verticulite, uh, coconut, koi, and a whole lot more. Well, uh, it, it looks very, well, uh, would I say, sophisticated. So I wonder how many Nigerians can be involved in this. Well, let's talk to someone who is involved in this in Nigeria and outside Nigeria. We have joining us the Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer of BIC Farms Concern, Mr. Debo Ali Onofora. Mr. Onofora joins us from Canada. Mr. Onofora, uh, good morning and thank you for your time. Good morning. Thank you for having me this morning. Yes, yeah, so I've had you on the program before, obviously, talking about how this uh, hydroponics since then till now. How popular has hydroponics uh, farming gotten in Nigeria? Well, hydroponics is quite popular now. Uh, I think in the last 10 years, quite a lot has been done. Um, today, there are a lot of young people who are involved in hydroponics. If you consider the fact that Nigeria is a young country and um, we've had this problem with the future of our food, when the average age of Nigerian farmers have been in the 50s, but recently a lot of young people saying what hydroponics can do have developed so much interest in agriculture. And hydroponics today is very popular. Uh, I can tell you a lot of young people and even adults now know that there is a type of farming called hydroponics or soilless farming. If you just Google, you will see some of our youth even describing themselves as I'm a soilless farmer, I'm a slave farmer and all that. So hydroponics is quite popular. Uh, my organization has trained over 40,000 people in hydroponics in 10 years and I know a lot of other organizations that are doing that. As we talk currently, there's a program going on in Nigeria, also by one of the international NGOs, training 12,000 young people in hydroponics over three years. So hydroponics is quite popular as, as of today. Yeah. So when we look at the pictures, you know, um, it looks really, um, uh, will I say, sensitive, like you need a special environment, special atmosphere, you know, and things like that. Uh, isn't that kind of a disadvantage or who can actually practice this and where? 
Well, I, I don't think it's a disadvantage. The, the problem has been a lot of ignorance in the field. Uh, for example, when you think plants just need soil to grow, and you are forgetting that a time comes when they tell you that that soil is no longer useful. Soil is a house nutrient. Soil is the support for plant. So when plant no longer finds nutrient in soil, what happens to that soil? And that's basically what has been happening. Nigeria have issue with food security, majorly because we kept using this primitive method of growing food. We can only grow food in the rainy season. We can only grow food in areas where there are soil. So areas where you don't have soil or you have issues with your soil, food production becomes an issue. Hydroponic simply says plants need certain things to grow. You need a good soil that is porous, that has good water holding capacity, that has good nutrients and all that. And that's what hydroponics is just about. What we have done is been able to now bring it to bear and to fall that people can see that, oh, crop can be grown properly and sustainably. Uh, let's look at the situation whereby Nigeria have 12 months of sunlight, 12 whole months of sunlight, and we are food insecure. It's, it's really sad. It is not something that is palatable to the hearing. You have times where you have winter month for several whole months of the year, and you can only grow within five months. Yet these climbs are food secured. So why should Nigeria be? It has been because of our food production practice. So hydroponics now has shown people that we can grow food all year round. Remember, hunger is not seasonal, as my friend we always say. So why should food production be seasonal? So using hydroponics, we have now seen that Nigeria can actually be food secured if we use the technology. And the good part about this is it's not an expensive like that technology. It's something that can be understood, you know, easily and be practicable. What we've done is shown that Nigeria can use technology to grow our food all year round and sustainably. So that's basically what hydroponics is all about. So I don't think uh, growing in a controlled environment is the issue. Look at tomato. Why does tomato grow more in the northern part than in the southern part? It's just the simple science of tomato. Tomato is a, it's a summer crop. That plant does not like water touching its leaves. When water touches leaves and it doesn't dry on time, it increases possibility of fungal infection and all this. So when you grow it in a controlled environment, in places where, okay, you have a higher rainfall and all that, tomato get to do better. Tomato has issues in the soil, maybe because of nematode, uh, bacteria wilt and all that. So you use an inert substrate, something that, okay, this one is plain, but you give it the nutrient that it needs. So these are sciences that, you know, help us to say food can be grown all year round if we know what we need to give to food. And that's just what it's, it's all about. Mm. So hydroponics is it's something that can be done. It, it shouldn't be that complex. And we don't need to see it as a complex technology. Everybody anywhere around can do hydroponics, even in your backyard. And I think I should also bring this picture to, to bear. On one acre of hydroponics, you can achieve what you need, 50 acres of open field to grow. So how many people have access to 50 acres of land? You can now say, oh, if I have one plot of land, I can grow the amount of food that somebody that has 15 plots of land is growing or more. So these are some of the things that hydroponics helps you to achieve and with, with, with limited space. Yeah. So... So tell me, um, I, I am an individual because I feel challenged now. I'm an individual and I want to, maybe if you, even if it's just for, because I see green pepper there are some of those pictures that you shared with us. I, I really love green pepper and I want to grow it. What do I do? How do I start? What do I need? Well, basically it starts with learning. Uh, I have a business, I tell people, first learn, then hand. Now, for example, green pepper, what does this crop need to grow? What does tomato need to grow? These are things we, we can understand and give to the plant. 
Water is uh, a combination of two elements, hydrogen and oxygen. Now, in nature, we say elements don't exist alone. They exist as compounds. They come together. So what are the things that each plant needs to grow? Let's give it to the plant using every available or whatever system you have. There's something we do in my organization. We call it beginner's mindset. When you look at the material and you ask, what can I do with this material? The moment the answer comes to mind, then you start to grow. Now, bell pepper is an exotic vegetable that has a good, uh, that commands a good pricing. It wasn't what we started with, but the reason we started focusing on bell pepper tomato is because, yes, you get to spend some amount of money to set up your hydroponic system, your greenhouse, your substrate, and all that. Then why would I grow a crop that I cannot sell at an advantage? Before now, bell peppers, beef tomatoes, cherry tomatoes are being imported into Nigeria. Now, these crops can now be grown easily. So when you know, okay, I can grow a crop that will command a commensurate amount of my investment over a short period of time, there you go for it. You can grow bell pepper in your backyard with a small space for your personal consumption. If you are now saying, okay, I want to sell, you know, or make money from bell pepper, then can I increase my growing space? Gradually, you can do that. But majorly start by learning, understand the crop, get used to it. When you have done that, you can now tell yourself, okay, I want to make money from this production. And then you move to the next level. So bell pepper, tomato, lettuce, as you can see, and all that, all of them have a know-how. The moment you understand the gap and you put it into it, you can you, you can produce this crop. I will also be willing to to share the know-how with you if you are interested. <laughs> I will appreciate that. Uh, but but what about government policies, laws, regulation, and all of that in practicing this hydroponics? Well, um, let, let me bring this. To bear. I, I remember the initial stage when we started this uh, technology. I went to one of the University of Agriculture in Nigeria and I was sharing with the professor there that this is technology for the future. And even now, young people get attracted to this type of farming because it's, it's attractive. They no longer see farming as being punitive. And he says, oh, Nigeria has the largest arable land in Africa. We have not used all our land. Now you are talking soilless. And I said, how can we use all our land when the average population of our country don't even feel interested in farming? Let's attract them first. Two years after, I saw him at work, all of my trainings, and it was like, you were right. This type of farming has attracted a lot of young people. So I said, now that we have gotten their attention, let's move to the next thing. Uh, government support had not been there at the initial stage, but over the time, I think a number of few things are coming. But uh, there is this problem of policy in some assault. Sometimes in 2017, there was a policy that says when you import greenhouses into Nigeria, it comes as zero duty. By 2020, somebody changed that. We had a meeting with the director of horticulture sometimes last year with the hotel, and it was like he was also shocked to see that somebody had changed that singular policy that you now have to pay. Now, in many times, go to China, go to some other countries, farmers are supported by simple policy, uh, subsidies like that. You import greenhouses, you don't get to pay uh, duty for it so that it comes cheap and people can set up. And these are some of the ways I think government can support. Look at fertilizers. Sometimes in 2017, 2018, there's a particular fertilizer called calcium nitrate. These are soluble fertilizers. They are high-end fertilizers. They are what we use in the greenhouse. A bag of calcium nitrate as of 2018 was 8,005. As I talk to you now, that same bag of calcium nitrate is 55, 60,000. A bag of potassium nitrate in 2018 was 9,000 naira. Today is 85,000. Now, what led to this? There was a change in the policy that all oh, these fertilizers are being used for bomb manufacturing and all that. Some said fertilizers are being manufactured in Nigeria. But these are not the type of fertilizers you manufacture in Nigeria. There's a principle we call uh, zero-sum phase in agriculture, um, law of minimum. 
what affects plant it's not the unavailability of your major nutrient it's unavailability of what we call micronutrient a micronutrient is not being produced in nigeria now when you now tag fertilizers that have micronutrients as being dangerous uh, when they were imported before the nsa gives end user certificate and all that but all that were withdrawn so these fertilizers are now being smuggled into nigeria and farmers have to pay 10 15 times the price or the cost of this fertilizer yet the price of food are not really appreciate across what you spent on it in 2018 a kilo of hydroponics tomato was 500 naira a kilo today it's still 500 naira except when we have scarcity that it shoots up yeah the cost of producing it over the last five years has increased by 500 percent so i think government can do more if understanding is put in place if they get to know that, oh this type of farming is necessary if we will be food secure let, let right. me give you this simple instance <laughs> in certain countries that has uh, a small province with 1 million 500 people exported six billion dollar worth of food in 2022 nigeria exported agro produce around two billion dollars that's in 2022 now compare now this time uh, just five months of growing period how come they export more food than us technology so All we right. need to understand that technology is an enabler and government really need to support it with so many things. All right. That's what I would say about that. All right, Mr. Nofora, thank you so much. We can feel your passion. And obviously, food is a major necessity and there are ways that we could boost the production in the midst of uh, the insecurity challenges and lack of mechanized farming or lack of adequate mechanized farming that we have in Nigeria, I guess it should be embraced. Perhaps it is hydroponic that is the answer. The Managing Director, Chief Executive Office of BIC Farms Concepts, Mr. Debo Ali Nofuora, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. All right, now let's head to the market and see how the market fared uh, last week. Yes, uh, for the NGX, it was uh, not a very positive one uh, for the NGX. Uh, it was down minus lost at the close of trade on Friday, 2.15%. Market cap was down 1.14%. Uh, activity, we see that uh, 11 stocks were traded. Oh, beg your pardon, that's for the NESD market. Uh, no wonder it's different from what we have here. So for the NGX, it was down 1.08%. Uh, and then, of course, remember we lost this, I think that was on Thursday, we lost the 104,000 sustained at equity, still at 58 trillion naira. And then we can also look at the fixed income market for last week. We had some auctions last week. We saw, we saw the second quarter calendar and what's going on there. Let's have Caleb Alimi uh, give us a bigger view of what happened and perhaps what we could expect. Uh, hi, Caleb. Good morning. Hi, Caleb. Can you hear me? So this is for the, uh, while we wait for Caleb, this is for the currency, the trade uh, of currency last week. Total weekly trade was $918.15 million. Uh, forwards, we see there had a week-on-week -week change of almost 100% for the forwards uh, at the close of trade. Uh, uh, derivatives, almost the same also uh, for that market. But week on week total change was down 52.88%. Daily average, we see FX spots 205.79 forwards uh, and derivatives uh, right there. If we could have the fixed income market for last week, I know we had a couple of auctions at the close of trade right there. And um, we have Caleb now, I believe. Hi, Caleb. Good morning. Hello, Caleb, can you hear me? All right, I, I think Caleb cannot hear me. We do have a bit of um, 
you know, drop there, right there. So um, it was a busy week for the FX market last week. Uh, we did see auctions and we saw a lot of movements right there with uh, the gain on the Naira and the increase in yields. We see more investors, you know, going that way. Perhaps that's why we see the NGX dropping. Uh, but we will follow up on the, that story. Uh, that's for the market, obviously, this week. We just have this week is so short. We're going to have only three trading days because tomorrow, Tuesday and Wednesday are both public holidays. Of course, the market would not operate. But uh, at 1 p.m., we're going to have uh, Business Incorporated. Ladi will be here, and uh, obviously, Anieti Edet will take us into the market to see what happened, the auctions. And uh, we've already started operating the second quarter uh, 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 calendar for the markets if you want the government to owe you you can look into that calendar and see perhaps you can get some money from the government right there but this is the much we can take don't forget to join Ladi williams and Edet and the other crew uh, by 1 p.m for business incorporated for more on the markets and a whole lot more i mean john mcwell back now to the sunrise daily studios